Good morning, one family. Good morning. Hey, listen, if we haven't met, my name is Mel. I'm the pastor here at One Family Church, and we are in a series called Kingdom Come. And if you are not familiar with this, maybe it's your first time you're visiting, we just want to, in our efforts this year, to put the kingdom first, we're going to spend some time kind of just trying to draw our attention to what life is like in the kingdom. One of the things that Jesus accomplishes on the cross through faith that we have, the opportunity, or when we put our faith in him, we acknowledge ourselves, not only as sons and daughters in the household of God, but we acknowledge ourselves as citizens in his kingdom. In this week, as I'm thinking about citizenship and just spending some time in the text, I, I, we're going to spend a lot of time understanding what it's like to be a citizen in the kingdom of God. But I just can't help but to think about one of our brothers, one of our own, who has become a citizen this past week, actually, um, uh, of the United States of America. So, yeah, yeah, that's, that deserves a whoop whoop. And he's not here. Well, he's here, but he's in the back. So, Diego, if you are listening, I need you to come up. You're, you don't know I'm going to do this, but just come on up, brother. Uh, you're back there listening some, some, somewhere in this building. But as he's making his way here, I hope that he's actually listening to this, but as he's making his way here, um, one of the things that, the reason why he's not actually standing here right now or sitting in the back somewhere communicating, uh, come on up, brother. You better come over here. It's like, uh, hello? I don't know what's next, but, uh, yes, yes, yes. Good, 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 good. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, listen, at one point, he was back there whispering in people's ears to try to translate. And now he's in the back somewhere because, you know, we wanted to try to provide a little less uh, distraction for somebody in the back that might not know what's happening. And they're looking back like, what's happening here? But what the Lord has done over the past few months is actually... Uh, provide the need for us to even have a translation, uh, translation ministry. So it's not fancy. Yeah, yeah, praise God for that. It's not fancy. We don't have everything together, but we're figuring out as we go. We have a lot of Spanish speakers within the city of Apopka. Our desire is to be a church that is uh, not only a safe place, but a welcoming space. And we want to make sure that the gospel can be heard in your own heart language. And so that's why our brother is here. But our brother has recently become a citizen. So look at what an American looks like here. This is an American. Turn around, bro. Turn around. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, American here. Um, brother, is there anything? I mean, we've been praying for you, and, and I don't know if this mic's going to work, guys. I just grabbed something. So this is just the sound guys in the back are like, why is he doing this? But here, hopefully it works when you say something. But just, man, um, anything, any word of encouragement? I know that we've, we've been praying for you. Just tell us this week as you finally got the, uh, just the official stamp of, of, of approval here, just how you feel. How has the Lord just kind of encouraged your heart in that? Okay, so. Woo! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stop. Okay. Disculpen los que hablan español. I was saying I'm sorry for those who speak in Spanish. Um, I really, I really was um, uh, moved by the Lord uh, this week during this time of five years trying to get the citizenship. For those who doesn't know, and I'm going to take one minute because I really believe this can bless our family in this aspect. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been in this position of having to uh, naturalize your citizenship, but let me just explain a little bit what is this about. Two years ago, I went and the citizenship citizenship for different reasons was denied. Remember that? There are many, many different structures and many, many different ways of uh, getting your citizenship. In my case, it was denied. Understanding it was not fair, but understanding also that uh, God was behind that, he would spoke to me with Joseph's story, remember? And he would tell me that this is not going to sound good, but in my case, as I was here alone as a missionary and I was staying in the United States just because the Lord was calling me to be here and staying here, my whole family, my whole friends by then were in my uh, country. Um, he told me that as Joseph needed to stay in the jail for two years uh, and then 
his purpose will fulfill. Um, that was the word of encouragement that I received to stay here. And what, that's why you saw me staying here and going and helping and serving Colombia, Argentina, and different places. When I finally got the citizenship on Wednesday, it was great that the night before and that I was really anxious, of course. I was studying. I knew everything. You could ask me it's 100, and 100 silly questions. I knew 150 probably. I was super ready for it. So I did my part. And the morning before that, I would wake up at 4 a.m. And uh, I was praying. And the Lord starts speaking to my heart and reminding me that I already used, you used such a good word. And we didn't talk about it. But I already was stamped by the most important uh, stamp in the, in, the, in the universe, which is the stamp of his son, Jesus Christ, in my heart. So I was going so confident in the sense of like, I got, I actually am citizenship of the hardest place ever to go in. I'm a citizenship of the heaven. And the, the, you know the best part of all is that, is that I'm, I, I got entrance to the hardest place ever to go in, but I haven't had to do anything for it. So I was like, wow, these five years has been so hard for me. It was so hard because I had to go through so many unfair things. And I had to, and uh, Danny was talking about our black community, and then we have Latino community, and every, every one of us goes through different unfair situations, you know? And I was saying to myself, sometimes no one understands me in these aspects. No one gets me, only God. There was no other one who was dealing with the same that I would have close to me in these years. So at the end, um, I'm super happy of being an American citizen. And thank you so much for receiving me in this beautiful country. But I already got the best one before even becoming an American. So, guys, bless this country. Bless the, the United States. But let's make sure we bless this country with the kingdom of heaven coming in. Okay? God bless you. Thank you, brother. I love you, brother. I love you. Um, you know, one, of the, one part about being a multi-ethnic church is that you ask a guy who, who could just say some kind words. He's starting to preach. And so you ask the Spanish guy to, to just say something kind, and he preaches a message. And so um, just, just super encouraged. Well, actually, um, one of the things that I, I, I've uh, been intentional to try to prepare to do is to, as we, as a church, continue to grow in our multi-ethnicity. Uh, some, some of that means that we learn some different things we're not used to learning. So one of the ways I've, I'll try that this morning is, si necesitas una Biblia, levante tu mano. Which means... Okay. Which means if you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand. And somebody's... Yes. Great. I practiced that for two months. <laughs> two months. So if you need a Bible, raise your hand, and someone's going to give you a Bible it, with uh, one of our Plug Team members with a red shirt. And, uh, and we are going to get ourselves. Oh, okay, we got two Plug Team members with a red shirt. They're going to come down the aisle, so raise your hand. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, listen, we have a lot of text to cover this morning. Usually, we would stand up and do a reading, uh, a scripture reading, but there's, there's, there's about 20-something verses we've got to go through, and so what I wanted to do and what Diego helped us to understand is he kind of set the stage for us. To be a citizen in a particular kingdom, the first thing you have to establish is that there is a king, okay? And when there's a king, there are expectations, there are decrees, there is a way of living that the citizens need to be aware of. Amen? And so, considering that we, those of us who believe, are citizens of heaven, citizens in the kingdom of God, we've got to understand a few things about the kingdom ethic as it pertains to what God expects in his economy, in his kingdom, in his world. We, we need to know his worldview. And so, Matthew 5 is going to help us, or the, the verses that we're going to be in today, this morning, is going to help us understand what it's like to live as a kingdom citizen. 
last week, Brother Ryan helped us to really, really understand one, one, many things. But one of the things I really want to draw our attention back to is that Jesus says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. So if you think that the righteousness that is external, the, the, the behavior, the, 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 the way of life of even the Pharisees um, was something to be valued, something to look after and to, 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 to model after, Jesus says, yeah, if it doesn't per- surpass even that, um, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And the reason why he says that is because there is a difference, um, and we're not going to pit these against each other, but you have to understand both the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. And so we're going to begin here with six principles that we need to understand in order to, under- and there's more, but we're going to highlight six principles in the kingdom of God that we're going to have to make sure we keep in mind as it draws our attention to the spirit of God's law, even beyond what is written in the letter. Let me pray for us, because this is big stuff we have to tackle this morning, and I want to help us to prepare our hearts, my own heart, for the reception of God's word. Father, we are desperate for clarity, for understanding, for guidance from your word. Holy Spirit, would you just penetrate in our hearts, help remove all distractions, not just in our hands, our phones, our plans after Sunday this morning, the, 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 the things that we might be thinking about, responsibilities we have, and help us to be present. Help us to have our eyes glued to the text, because we want to know not the opinions of man, but we want to hear from you. We know that we are so prone to wander. We know that Uh, Every aspect of the call of righteousness is so difficult for us because of our nature. Would you help us, Holy Spirit, fill us even now to not only have, not only leave here with a bigger head, but a transformed heart. We don't just want to know some things and be able to answer a question rightly. We want to be transformed by your spirit, sanctified, matured, so that we would walk out of here ready to be the light that we were called to be. Uh, to be the salt of the earth, God, would you just work in us in a way that only you can so that we would be um, beautiful representatives and ambassadors of your kingdom. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Help us to hear, help me to speak, Father, and and, and Father, remove every stumbling block that would block us from our understanding and our intimacy with you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And the church says, all right, well, one of the first things that Jesus addresses as he is beginning to teach in this Sermon of the Mount. And we've already been in this. And remember, it's five, six, seven, three chapters to help us understand the kingdom ethic. And he begins by giving us and reminding us, drawing our attention um, of the traditional teachings of the Scriptures, maybe the traditional interpretations of the things that God has said, and, gave, and, and he gives us some maybe clarifying understandings and interpretations of that, um, which for many of these people listening sounds like an incredibly radical new teaching. Um, I, I just want to draw our attention to one more thing here, and that is that Jesus is not necessarily bringing in uh, completely new teachings that destroy the old or does away with what was taught rightly in God's Word before, but he's He's providing a greater clarity in how we understand it. And he begins with something that I think maybe most of us here might feel uh, that this is not a challenge for us, and that is murder. And so as we start to begin to unpack murder, here's one point I want us to just keep in mind. In the kingdom of God, the citizens are, uh, uh, its citizens might be angry, but we, we are angry about the right thing, Okay. In the, city, in the kingdom of God, citizens are angry about the right thing. Look at verse 21. You've heard it said, To our ancestors, do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. This is a direct quote from Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. God says, do not murder. And here's the thing. We hear this, and for many of us, we're like, whew, 
That's an easy one. <laughs> that, that's an easy one. I, don't, I have never murdered anyone. I have no plans of murdering anyone. And I'm going to go a step further. I don't even know anyone who's murdered anyone. And so I'm good. So what, what else is next? Come on, come on. Give me, give me something harder. But don't be too confident in your righteousness. Remember, you, your righteousness is going to have to surpass that even of the scribes and Pharisees. Look at verse 22. You might have heard that said, but I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court. And whoever says, you fool, will be subject to hellfire. We've got a lot of explaining to do. Because here in the text, Jesus is saying that your anger deserves to be judged even in the same way that murder does. So rightly understood, the law goes much further than his hearers had reckoned. For them, they thought that it was enough to just not put someone to death. As long as they have not actually put their hand towards the murdering of another human being, that they were free and clear from any kind of judgment that would be due some kind of sin, uh, that kind of sin. But what Jesus does is that it is help us to see that you not murdering is actually just the beginning. Because what we have to understand is that the cause of murder, what leads to murder, is something that every single person in this room struggles with here and there. Probably more than you'd like to admit. And that is anger. Not only is anger worthy of the same judgment as murder in the economy of God and the kingdom of God, but even your insult towards a brother or a sister is worthy of hellfire. Now, before we even continue here, I just want to provide a disclaimer. Um, we've got to be careful not to think that Jesus is forbidding all anger for all people. Jesus himself was angry when he cleared the temple. Remember that? He saw injustice and he had a problem with it. And so he began clearing the temple. That wasn't just a, a kind, smiling Jesus flipping a table over. He was angry. He was angry when the Pharisees tried to accuse him of being a lawbreaker for healing on the Sabbath. He reminds everybody that it is good to do good on the Sabbath. And they're wrong, and uh, they, they were trying to find a reason to make him guilty of some kind of sin. Jesus is upset. If the Bible says he was indignant, Jesus is angry at his disciples for not uh, for for their rebuking of of parents that were bringing the the children to him so that they would bless him, and he's angry at them as well. He says, "Let the little ones come to me." This wasn't just, ah, oh, come on, Peter, out of the way. Come here, little guy. He, he was angry with them. Don't stop the parents from bringing their children to Jesus. So there is a place for anger in the Bible. Remember, in the kingdom of God, the citizens are angry about the right thing. Remember, a few weeks ago, we talked about even mourning. Blessed are those who mourn. What will we mourn? The brokenness of the world. We, we mourn our sin. We mourn the impacts of sin in our society. And guess what? As a citizen of heaven, as a, children, uh, as a child of God, as a child of the king, you, you're a sign of maturity is that you feel about things the way God feels about them. And so if God is angry about something, you should be angry about something. If God is angry at injustice, you ought to be angry at injustice. If God is angry with how someone is being treated violently, you ought to be angry about that. Any aspect of the, the, of the brokenness of our world that we experience should, should either grieve us or anger us because it does God. And so this is not a prohibition 
for all kinds of anger. It's just we have to make sure that we remember the text that says, be angry, but do not sin. And so, here's a question we really are going to have to wrestle with ourselves. Has, has Christ's righteousness truly penetrated our relationship with others? He says, don't be angry. How are you doing with that? Who has wronged you? Think about that for a second. There's somebody who has done something to you that you didn't like. Not only have you been angry, uh, are you ang- have you been angry with that individual, but you think thoughts. And in your mind, you have all these movies playing in your brain about them slipping on a banana peel. Or that person that cut you off on the road and they gave you a signal that let's welcome to America. They communicate with fingers too. It's not just sign language. That's just Are you imagining them as they cross you over crashing on the side of the road? Maybe you even, you've even said some things, maybe even if it's in your heart. Idiot, fool, good for nothing. Maybe more words that you would never say in front of anybody here. The word fool is really just kind of airhead, an empty-headed individual, uh, kind of a worthless person. If you find yourself, and, and I would argue if you're going to tell the truth, every hand can go up here about the, the anger that you have felt uh, towards others. Maybe even when I brought that up, you're thinking about someone in your mind right now. If you've ever felt angry towards someone, the Bible would say, yeah, this too is something that we have to repent. It's not because maybe you weren't done wrong. We ought to grieve that sin. But the anger that's in your heart is only the, the beginning root of, the, of what can manifest into something much more harmful, and that is, uh, I don't even want to say more harmful, but, but something that would manifest into a greater level of, uh, of, of an outward experience of, of murder. When you look into a, a Rikers Island or you look into a jail cell and you hear about people who have done horrific things, you, you just need to know before you start pointing a finger at someone else's evil, that all the only difference between you and them is that they had an opportunity and they took it. You have the same thing in you that the murderer who's there for life had in them before they made that decision. They got caught. They engaged because the opportunity presented itself. But if you are angry with your brother or your sister, it's worthy of the same judgment. And so we 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 have to not only watch and, 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 and figure out how do we deal with our heart problem, but then our hearts, our thoughts, the things that we feel, we've got to guard our mouths, not just our, 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 the, our minds. And we don't need new words to say, we need a new heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. But how do you get this new heart? You need a renewed heart. You need a new heart, and only Jesus is the one who can provide that. So we keep reading here, verse 23, if you are offering your gift on the altar, And there, you remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled with your brother and sister, or your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Here's what you need to know about this. God will not recognize the unreconciled. Let me help you again. God will not recognize... Recognize the unreconciled. It's far more important to be reconciled to your brother than to fulfill external duties of worship. Some of us here have have either uh, uh, something against your brother or sister, or, or you know somebody has a problem with you. And instead of dealing with it, you just continue to walk into service, you're fellowshipping and ready to, okay, where's the offering? I just feel very generous this morning. Your hands are lifted. 
running around the church building, and, and, and you're just here to worship God. I'm here to worship God. But yet you are, there's no peace between you and your brother. Oh, and, and here in this text, look, it says you remember that someone has something against you. But you know that. Do you think that your heavenly Father cares about the unity that you guys have or about making sure that you fulfill your, 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 your tradition and your religious duties? And so one of the things that I want to call us to and what the, the scriptures call us to is to be a peacemaker. Remember a few weeks ago, blessed are all those peacemakers, not peacekeepers. The peacekeepers don't address issues. They don't step into conflict. The peacemakers do that. And so... The first thing we have to do as a peacemaker is prioritize. What do, I mean, what, do I, what do I mean by prioritize? Well, what I mean by prioritize is that um, we're going to make sure that we understand what's, of, what's more important in our daily walk. Um, and, and that's our love for one another than our ability to make sure we check off our religious boxes. You can't love someone that you refuse to reconcile with. So, so just, if we're called to love, by this the world will know that you are my disciples, by your love for one another. If you can't reconcile with someone, you can't love them. You're not loving them. You are actively not loving an individual that you are called, uh, that, 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 that you refuse to reconcile with. So our peace, brothers and sisters, with one another is supposed to flow out of our peace with God. So if you are one who actually has peace, peace with God, out of that peace that exists, there should be a horizontal reflection of that. Because you have peace with God, you're able to, to, to reconcile, to forgive, to, to repent when repentance is needed. So our difficulty in loving others is a, a, is a reflection of our difficulty in loving God. Maybe some of us don't feel that that's true. Here's the reality. The greatest command is that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you, it is impossible to show or to display in any way the love you declare to have without seeing that displayed through the relationships you have in the world. Period. The two are connected. People who are unloving, not engaged in unifying, peacemaking relationships, cannot say they love God. How? Where's the evidence? Who is the recipient of this love that you have? Our love is supposed to display or to be a picture of what's already true between you and the Lord. And so the two cannot be separated. So we got to prioritize. First things first. I know I should be here and I should give something. I know I need to take this communion and engage in our religious responsibilities. But sometimes you just might need to pause and text that person and say, hey, I know you're upset with me and I shouldn't have done that. Um, I just wanted to text you right now because I, I don't, I don't want to just step into just, just keep going with the, going through the motions. After service, let's, let's, let's talk. I, I'm acknowledging that. So prioritize. But the second thing is to pursue. Be the first to repent. Do what I call the three A's. Acknowledge, ask, and allow. What does acknowledge mean? It's just confess and, and affirm. That was wrong, but I, what I did. Right? Like I just said earlier. But sometimes that's where it starts. It's just acknowledge and affirm to that person that they're not crazy. You did do them wrong. Don't have someone sit there and wonder if they're, they're losing their mind that this is bothering them as much, uh, as much as it did. Affirm and acknowledge this is, what, this is what confession is. It's the agreement with God. I, Father, I agree with you that my actions are less than holy, that they fall short. Acknowledging that to someone you've wronged is a great first step. The second thing is ask. For forgiveness. Will you forgive me? I, I can't believe I did that. Not sitting there and then giving 50,000 reasons why you did that. 
I know, I'm sorry about that, Andrew, but the, the thing is, if you, you know, this week, the thing, it, it, the, what had happened was, I don't want to hear what had happened. I don't need a, a, a backlog of all the reasons why you've sinned against me. It doesn't help me. Just ask for forgiveness. Here's the last one. This is big because it's hard. Allow. Allow time for that person to heal and build some trust. Uh, the Bible does say that if you can't forgive someone, they, you can't be forgiven. But sometimes, I mean, okay, you just came to me. You're asking for forgiveness. Okay, I forgive you. But now it's like, all right, come on, let's go. Come on. Like, I, Clement, I apologize. Why are you still, you're still upset? I mean, shouldn't this be done? I just said sorry. I mean, what do we? Give me time, okay? Uh, it's once been said, and I don't remember exactly who said this, but trust is lost in buckets, but it's regained in joy. That doesn't mean to perpetuate this, un, uh, you know, this lack of forgiveness and to just, you know, I, I don't know when I'm going to forgive you. I just, I'm just saying give people space, have the conversation, acknowledge what you've done, ask for forgiveness, and then just give them some time to recollect their, their thoughts. Um, our, our worship with God should be um, seen through a life of love towards others. And so it's better to offer grace or an apology to your brother than to, than to give a gift of adoration to your father. So this is what the text is saying here. First, put that to the side. Go reconcile with your brother and sister. Priority. Go and pursue. Look at verse 25. Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on the way with him in court. Or your adversary will hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. This here is a principle in the economy of God to just, and we ought to really pay attention to this, settle issues quickly, especially when you know you're the problem. Be quick to right your wrong. Ephesians 4.26 we said it earlier, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. And don't give the devil an opportunity. This does not mean that you can't go to sleep if you're angry. Okay? That's not necessary. I know we talk about that. There's, there's couples out there that's like, ah, oh, we're, still, we're still upset with each other. And it's like, it's about to be 11. Uh, the sun's about to go down. Ah, oh, ah, oh, we're sinning against God. Um. What the text is really trying to say is do not let there be any unreasonable, prolonged time with you stewing in your anger. Sometimes, guys, you, you need to sleep on it, okay? <laughs> Sometimes you do need to sleep on it. Sometimes you need to just, because you're going at it for hours, take a break. Take a break. Stop the argument. And oftentimes, and the reason why we even say the word sleep on it is because sometimes when you just kind of suspended the fight and took a nap, you wake up and you're, you're, you're not as upset as you were before. You, you might still be upset, but, but you realize that maybe we're fighting about something that is stupid. So, so sometimes you need space. There are moments where someone says something very wrong to you and then they're expecting for you to give them a response back and you have to look at them and say, hey, um, Cody, I have some thoughts. It's best right now if I just take some time to consider what you just said. I'm sure there's some kernels of truth in that. But if I respond right now, um, the results won't be favorable. And so I don't want to give the devil a foothold. Therefore, I'm going to give some space and some time to think. So, so again, the time you're taking is not just going to sleep angry and st stewing. It's let me intentionally ask the Lord to help me to process what's being said, not to try to defend my position and to try to understand my brother or to, 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 to um, have him work on my heart and to, to uh, remove this anger that I'm feeling towards them. 
And this is important because, again, it reminds us that it's important to not um, win the argument and lose your brother. Lots of husbands need to hear that. Wives, too, but I'm just going to highlight the husbands. Sorry, fellas. If you're right, if you won the argument, but lost your wife's sense of value and, and, and her, and her, her, she doesn't feel loved by you, but you're right, you've lost. You just lost. Don't win an argument and lose your spouse, your brother, your sister. You got to care more about the person than your point. Uh, so, the, 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 so that's the, that's the thing. The, the, the kingdom of heaven, the citizens are angry about the right thing. But the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, it, its citizens see people as image bearers, not objects. Look at verse 27. You've heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so this is another hard teaching because some people have felt really, really good because they've been faithful. They have honored their wives in their eyes. They have refrained from dealing sinfully with another woman and thereby thereby defiling their marriage. But here Jesus is saying that adultery is really just a manifestation of what has already taken place. When you actually step outside of your marriage. All you're doing is displaying what has already taken place. So to look at someone lustfully is to commit adultery with her in your heart. That's what he's saying. He's not being cute. He's not being poetic. If you feel a little bit of weightiness there, good. Because you have to understand it's simply, it's like a, um, you know, we don't have much props here. Uh, you know, let's just pretend that this is an orange, okay? See that? Orange. Nice and orange. And you see it? Yeah, it smells great. And, and I've seen this illustration, and I just think it's so helpful in understanding what Jesus is trying to help us understand here. What, what happens if you take this orange? What color is this? Okay, just making sure we're on the same page here. What happens when you squeeze this thing? What, what's going to come out of it? Okay. What if somebody significantly stronger, 30 times stronger than me, grabs this orange and, you know, somebody like Nicole, 30 times stronger. She's, by the way, I have a mark here in my nose. Um, where did that come from? Nicole might know the answer to that, but um, I'm bringing in my marital challenges into the pulpit. Pray for, my, pray for your sister. Pray for your sister. If anyone has a grievance towards their sister, go to them. I went. And this is what happened. All right. If somebody squeezes this orange even harder than I could, what's going to come out? Okay, what, what if I call it something different? What if instead of saying that this is an orange, this is an orange, but what if I just choose to call it apple? What will come out still? Why is that? It's what it is. I know that some of us are like, okay, I'm going to kids ministry because y'all, you just, I thought this was supposed to be big church. (laughs) Um, It doesn't matter what I call it. It doesn't matter how I squeeze it. The only thing that can come out is what's already inside. This is obvious. It's not profound. But before you leave and go over to kids ministry, Here's my question. What comes out of you when life squeezes you? Just just don't leave yet. Kids ministry is still open, but what comes out of you? Is it is it anger? Is it harsh words? Is it impatience? Is it deceitfulness? Is it complaining? Is it lust? Just like the orange, the only thing that could ever come out of you is what's already inside of you. And hear this, it doesn't matter what the woman at the grocery store is wearing. She's not the reason you're lusting after her. The 
the evil that's in your own heart. That's why you're lusting. It's not what she's wearing. Oh, they're wearing the, the, the clothes that she's wearing. Is, oh, the women these days. Oh, if only they. It's your heart. I'm not saying it doesn't matter what people wear. I'm not saying that modesty should not be considered. But what I'm saying is that even before a woman has a dress code problem, you have a perversion problem. That's the problem. Ladies, you're not off the hook. Because I found that for some reason in the church, and I've seen this, that we think men are the only people that lust. And so some ladies, not all, some ladies normalize lustful discussions about certain celebrities or fit men with nice bodies in the movies or at the beach. And it's like normal to kind of talk about their, their crush, their celebrity crush in these lustful ways. And I've even heard husbands actually talk about how much their wives love seeing these guys. Oh, yeah, my, my, my wife loves, you know, uh, uh, this, this athlete. Oh, they just, they just love LeBron James. I mean, everything about LeBron James. They just, and it's like, well, you, okay, brother, like if she's describing all of his physique and all, like it, does that bother you at all? It's not okay. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman, you need to understand that people are not objects that you just get to enjoy and experience and, and, and fantasize with your sinful desires. And so it's what's already in you that leads to these kinds of behaviors. Remember Matthew 15, verse 10 through 11, Jesus says, listen and understand, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. And this is, what, this is the heart of verse 29 here. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one part of your body, uh, one of the parts of your body, than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. More and more hard truths. Uh, the right eye was thought of as especially valuable for a warrior because uh, this was typically the more dominant eye. And if you lacked it, you would be in big trouble. Um, and so what Jesus is trying to say here is that there, there ought to be no compromise with evil. But we have to deal radically with sin. That's what he's saying here. Um, the point, though, is not that we, we literally need to mutilate our bodies because that's not going to solve the problem. The, the issue that you have will not be dealt with by, okay, okay, the, the right hand, and he's going to get to that in a second, but let me just go ahead and gouge the, the, the right eye out, and, and, and therefore my lust problem is gone. If that was the case, that just destroying or eliminating body parts was enough to solve our sin problem, that would actually be the easy part. It, it sounds gruesome, but if that could actually do it, that's the easy part. Unfortunately, it doesn't solve our problem. The problem is that our hands always follow the heart. John Owen says this famous phrase, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. We, we've got to be radical, not, not, not compromising with sin. You ought to look at something that is a situation that could compromise your purity, your faithfulness, and deal with it with the utmost measures. That's what he's saying here. And although removing body parts will not help your heart, there might still be some things that you do need to gouge out and you do need to cut off to at least assist you from manifesting what's already inside of you. Maybe it's social media sites. Gazing a little bit too long in these inappropriate Instagram videos. Maybe there's some pages on social media that you need to unfollow. Maybe you're struggling with porn. There are tools and applications uh, that many of you guys, some of you guys might be aware of. If you're not, pay attention to this, Covenant Eyes or Canopy. These are resources that you ought to look into. These are softwares that you can install on your phone, install on your 
iPad, every single one of your devices, and find an accountability partner in the church so that when you find yourself going to sites you shouldn't be going into, you have a brother or a sister that can reach out and say, hey, you doing all right? Just got a notification on my phone. I am on the list for some folks who have asked, hey, could you, um, I'm trying to fight this thing. I need your name, your email to be on this thing so that whenever I'm wrestling, I know that there's always somebody. God is always watching, but sometimes you need, it, you need some support with someone from his body that's going to be able to provide some accountability. So Canopy is one of them. And Covenant Eyes is another one of them. And, and you've got to give them permission to challenge. You've got to give them permission to have the hard conversation. Don't make this more awkward than it already is for them. Maybe you need to get a dumb phone instead of a smartphone. Go over to the, to the, to the thing down the street and just say, can you give me a dumb phone? And all it has is the snake game on it. Where you can just, boop, boop. no more apps. Maybe you need to visit Home Depot, buy a sludge hammer, bring it to your house. If you have two, two flights of stairs, go up there, smash the computer, throw it out the window, and start going to the library to get work done. Because you notice you can't handle it. Ah, I, I need this computer for work. I got to, okay. But you're destroying your relationships in your marriage. You're defiling yourself. You're finding ways and loopholes, even with the resources that we've given you. Get rid of it. Gouge it out of your life. Because it is better to have to struggle with Wi-Fi than to constantly find yourself backpedaling in your relationship with God and the newness of life that he calls you to walk in. There's no sensual sin that was ever committed, that was not first imagined. So, if you can think it, you can do it. So we don't need new eyes, we don't need new hands, we don't even need better technology or better devices. What do we need? We, we need renewed hearts. We have a heart problem. And so this is what Jesus is trying to Articulate. You want to know what righteousness that surpasses the Pharisees looks like? Here it is. And now we move on to the subject of divorce. But what I want us to remember here is that in the kingdom of God, our love is not temporary but eternal. This is what it's like to live in the kingdom of God. And what we're going to see here is what the Christian attitude should be regarding divorce. Is it always forbidden? Is it sometimes allowed? And, and before we even get into that, I just want to highlight that I recognize that there are many, many stories here of people who have experienced and have gone through the painful effects of divorce. Um, and, and even if you have not been divorced, you've experienced the, 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 the consequences of that maybe within your family. And regardless of the reason for, for divorce. So I want to be sensitive to the realities and the complications that exist when it comes to, to this matter. Um, and at the same time, we're going to be biblical. And so the bottom line, regardless of what we've gone through, we should always be the kinds of people in every circumstance, every situation to ask ourselves, but man, what does God's word say about this? So let's look at the text together. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. And if we're going to need, if we're, if we're trying to understand uh, this statement on divorce, we, we kind of need to understand that there was some controversial perspectives uh, during the day. And the controversy was really centered around uh, a text in Deuteronomy about the word indecency. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, the scripture says, if a man marries a woman, but she becomes displeasing to him, or there's some kind of indecency that's revealed, um, he may write her a divorce certificate, hand it to her, and send her away from his 
powers. And so the controversy that exists even in the days of Jesus is this, the, the, the deferring views on what's, what is considered indecent. So the burning question for Jesus is the same thing. I mean, what does something indecent actually mean? Um, another thing to consider is that there's two schools of thought. The, 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 there, there's these two elders, highly respected in the community, uh, in the Jewish community, uh, Hillel and Shammai. And so the liberal school was the school of Hillel, which interpreted indecent in the most loose way. And so they believed and they, they communicated that a man could divorce his wife if she spoiled his dinner. They believed that uh, indecency could be really just walking down with your hair out a certain way. Um, speaking to men in the street, being disrespectful to your husband's parents in his presence. Talking about my mama is an indecency. The school of Hillel was opposed to the school of Shammai, which limited indecent to offenses of marital impropriety. Indecent to them did not, defer, did not refer to adultery because that was punished by execution, but rather suggested other types of sexual misconduct like shameful exposure, showing parts of yourself that was not um, appropriate to show. And so in the midst of these controversies and these two schools of thought, you go to Matthew 19, and verse 3, the Pharisees come to Jesus. They're asking about this question. They try to test him, and they ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And so they're trying to trap Jesus, and, but this is the heart of what, why they're asking this question. Um, this is a very challenging uh, point of concern within the culture because whatever Jesus says next could, could have major consequences to the people in, in, the, in the day. And so uh, even to understand that the certificate of divorce dynamic was given by Moses and it was accepted throughout uh, Judaism that a man was entitled to divorce his wife, but a woman or a wife was not permitted to divorce her husband, though she could petition to the court and if her plea was accepted, the court would direct the husband to divorce her. Um, this was all a way to protect bozo husbands from manipulating and taking advantage of their wives. They would kick the wife out for some fake indecency. Now she has no ability to remarry because she doesn't have a certificate of divorce and, then, and could later then claim, wait, this is my wife. Now she's with him. She should be stoned to death. And so that's why Jesus says it wasn't like this in the beginning. The only reason why Moses even allowed this is because your hearts were evil. And so what is Jesus' view of marriage? We have to ask this question, guys, because Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, look at what it says about Jesus. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus is the creator of marriage. His thoughts about this matter. It matters because marriage itself is a picture of him as the groom and the church as his body. Adam was first. You remember that? Eve was made out of the body of Adam, his rib. And the two become one flesh. And so when Jesus answers the question in Matthew 19, he refers back to the beginning. He, he doesn't give new ideas. He says, you want, to answer, you, want, you want the answer to that? Let's go to Genesis. And he communicates the reality and the purpose of what marriage is for. Because he was there when he instituted it. Genesis chapter 2, verse 22. The Lord God made the rib and he, that he had taken from the woman, or from the man, into, um, uh, the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and the 
and, and the two become one flesh. Both man and his wife were naked yet felt no shame. This is Jesus' view of marriage. This is why, even though there may be some cases where divorce is permitted, it's never preferred. Though it may be granted, it's never good. And when I say it's not good, I'm not saying bad person if you've ever done, bad person if you've ever been, been divorced. That's not what we're, I'm saying. It's just that it's, it's not ideal. It's not the way it was supposed to be. Yes, there might be a permitted reason, but it's, it's not necessarily commanded. Because marriage is supposed to be a beautiful picture to the world of the never-ending love and unity of Jesus and his bride. The divorce takes that picture, defiles it, and displays the brokenness of humanity and sex. So this is why Jesus says, I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife except in the case of sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Because no one has any right to undo what God has put together. Jesus says, they are no longer two in Matthew 19. In answering some of these questions, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Now, God does not like divorce. God hates divorce because he knows that sin, he, he knows with a true understanding, more than any counselor, more than any leader, pastor, or someone in your community can know. He, he understands and knows the sin that caused, that was caused in, in this, uh, in the relationship. He knows the sin that was endured in the relationship. He understands the unrepentance and the cause of pain in the relationship. And so that, that's what he's grieving. He hates it because of the pain and brokenness that was experienced in the marriage that led to the divorce. It's not just don't do this because I just don't want to do it. He, he knows that before it ever gets to that, a lot of brokenness takes place. God hates divorce because it is the antithesis of what marriage is supposed to display. And so Jesus' teaching is very radical. It's unheard of. And the reason why is because it eliminates this discussion of indecency. But we're not going back and forth debating on what's indecent. Unless it is these parameters, sexual immorality, uh, sexual adultery, and there are some other passages of Scripture that give us some guidance on how to navigate even more complicated things that, not, that aren't necessarily addressed here. But if, if, if you think you can just find random man-made reasons why you walk away from your spouse, um, it's an illegitimate separation. And we know that this is a radical teaching family because the disciples' response to Jesus shows us that. You know what the, you know what the disciples say? If this is the situation, this is his disciples. If this is a situation between a husband and a wife, it's better not to marry. The disciples are hearing the teachings of Jesus, and they concluded it's probably better not to marry. Their minds are blown away. Because if the only ground for divorce was unfaithfulness, if none of the exceptions suggested by the school of Hillel or Shammai were valid, it's better to stay single. Because of the idea of unconditional love, not expecting that a person perform for you before you fulfill your marital duties to them sounds hard, it's because it is hard. Because when you get married, you're saying, it doesn't matter what, how, how faithful the person is, I'm going to be faithful. It doesn't matter their faithlessness. I have committed to something and I'm going to stick to it. And if you don't think you can handle that in this season of life, it's probably better not to step into a relationship like that. I think that their conclusion is not off because they understand now the weight. You can't just, I don't like this, out, because the relationships in the kingdom of God are eternal, not temporal. So God does not recognize an illegitimate divorce. And this is why you're considered an adulterer if you were married because um, only a married person can commit adultery. You can, commit sexual, you can commit sexual immorality, but an illegitimate divorce is not recognized as a divorce in the eyes of God. And so he says, 
forgiveness. You marry someone who's illegitimately divorced and you have committed adultery and caused them to commit adultery. This is hard teaching. And I know that there are complicated situations that even are more complicated than merely looking at a situation and, oh, sexual adultery. And the Bible has plenty of areas in Scripture that help us to guide one another and how we should navigate a situation when someone is is abused and and and, or being abandoned here here's what i want to encourage us if you find yourself thinking that you're probably close to something like that for those who are made in the room i think this is in the near future i want to encourage you don't come to that decision without biblical community and the church to help you process and navigate that But even more so, let the word be the primary driver for all that you are getting ready to step into. Bring us into that conversation so we can help you think through via biblical lens. In the kingdom of God, the citizens tell the truth because they live by the truth. That's our fourth point here. Look at verse 33. Again, you've heard it said to our ancestors, you must not break your oath, but you must keep your oaths to the Lord. But I tell you, do not take an oath. At all, either by heaven because it is God's throne or by the earth because it's his footstool or by Jerusalem because it is the city of the great king. Don't swear by your head because you cannot make a single hair white or black. But let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. Anything more than this is from the evil one. This one is simple. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Oaths are for those where trust is not present. We need to be the kind of people who are trustworthy and don't need to go above and beyond to prove that what we're saying is true. We've got to consider God because God is trustworthy. His word alone is enough. Look at this Lifeway article uh, 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 talking about how people dealt with oaths in the Old Test- uh, in, in, in the days of Jesus, the rabbinical teaching perverted the purpose of oaths. Instead of calling on God to assure honesty, oaths were phrased so as to avoid God's punishment when speaking dishonestly. So since oaths no longer guaranteed anything, Jesus removed the artificial distinction between vows that are invoked in God's name, which were binding, and those that did not and were not binding. Whatever anyone swears by, Jesus says it refers to God. If if someone swears by heaven, He invokes God, for heaven is his throne. If someone swears by earth, he invokes God because it's his footstool. If someone swears by Jerusalem, he invokes God because it is the city of the king. If someone swears by the hairs of his own head, he invokes God, for he rules our own heads. All oaths call God to to witness, for he created and sustains all things, even our hair. So, none of the extra language about, no, 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 for real, for real. I swear, I put that on my mama. Why you got to put it on your mama? Just yes or no. Will you do this or will you not do this? Now, here's another helpful thing for us that I really want to encourage us with, family. Uh, uh, Our brother Quasi, uh, he came to do a a training for our staff team once, and one of the things that he was... uh, um, uh, kind of helping us to understand is just the different dynamics of, of work and, and um, balancing our lives appropriately and prioritizing some things. And one of the things he said that was just striking, you've probably heard this before, that no is a complete sentence. And, and that's so important. It's important for me to hear because oftentimes we're tempted to make up reasons for why we're not able to do this or that when somebody asks you to do something. And now, instead of just saying no, can't do it. We're adding all this extra stuff, all this extra thing. Oh, you know, I can't do that because, you know, I, I have this thing and da 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 And it's like, you're, just say no, because now you're about to start lying. Just say no. You, you don't want to do it. Say no. <laughs> On the flip side, though, and, but by the way, just real, before I even go there, because then what happens is you either say yes and you know you're not going to go do that thing. You just don't. You just don't want to disappoint. So you say, "You know what? You, you know what, uh, Howard? Yes, I'll be there." And you're already preparing what your text message is going to be for that person 
when you don't show up. Why'd you do that? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. But on the flip side, we also have to be very careful not to manipulate people and get them to say what we want them to say and put them in that situation. What, what do I mean by that? Hey, Stacy, um, I, I just have a question for you. Um, you're, I kind of, I don't know what I'm going to do if you don't say yes to this, but it's totally fine if you don't. Um, but I'm going to need this right. You see what you just did there? You're, you're asking someone to help you with something, but you basically make it sinful for them to say no. You've got to give people, so just be straight up. Hey, listen, I'm desperate. I need somebody to do that. Can you do it? If the answer is no, because they can't do it, they can deal with the Lord and whatever that, whatever that means for them. There could be a legitimate reason why they can't. It could be that they're lazy. It could be that, whatever. But that's not your job to determine. Ask the question. If it's no, move on. Don't manipulate people with your question to get them to do what you want them to do. And then you get mad when they're like, hey, I know I said I was going to be there, but... Well, I don't know what other answer they could have said the way you asked the question. We got to be careful. Let your yes be yes and your no mean no. Anything more than that is from the evil one. In the kingdom of God, two wrongs don't make a right. Look at verse 38. You've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. How many have walked in that um, in, in obedience in this? How many of you? Okay. 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 So, Frenchie. Okay, Frenchie, I see you. I see you. Two hands. As for the one who wants to sue you and take away your shirt, let him have your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks you, and don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. He, here's the thing. We have this adult, we have this um, idolatrous need to defend ourselves. It doesn't have to be a physical altercation here, guys. Um, by the way, um, if somebody comes in your house and wants to harm you and your family, I hope you do something about that. Okay? This is not, hey, Robert, I'm, let me just read this passage of Scripture. And so before you just slap all of us, I'm just going to let you know, I'm going to prepare to turn the other cheek too, and you can take everything you know. Protect your home. It's okay. Self-defense is not a sin, okay? But we do need to deal with the heart of retaliation because retaliation is a heart problem. So there, there's no resolution in retaliation. Our, our problems are not solved by creating bigger problems for other people. When, a pro, when someone is a problem for you, the solution is not, let me become a problem for them. Fire plus fire equals what? Bigger fire. Somebody said water. Woo. Got to go back to science. 101. In the beginning, okay, We've got to go above, uh, above and beyond for peace. That, that's what this is saying here. We, we, we've got to be a peacemaker. We've got to go above and beyond. Um, repentance is not just stated. I repent. It's demonstrated. If the shirt off my back is going to end all of this, just take this. Just take this with you. Just, just take. I, I, I don't want to be in this situation where this is the constant fighting. And so whatever you think is going to resolve this, I'm going to add to it. This is what he's saying, go, go, going above and beyond. Give us, give us much mercy as you would like to receive. Forgive us our debt is, what, is, what, is how Jesus taught us to pray, as we forgive our debtors. And, and so hopefully that, that's, some, that's not a prayer that sounds scary to you because you're actually forgiving people. Grace is when you receive what you don't deserve, and mercy is when you don't receive what you do 
active role. I think we need to be a kind of people that are marked by mercy. We, we've got to be able to, even though we, we, we probably have, we, we could stand up for ourselves here, or we could take this thing off, fight this thing all the way to the death, because I'm right here. It's like, you know what? What's going to make this right? Let, let's, let, let's resolve this. Let's go to this last one here. In the kingdom of God, everyone experiences the love of God. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. In the kingdom of God, everybody experiences the love of God. Um, you might have enemies, but you're called not to be one. Just because someone has something against you doesn't mean, again, that you need to now have something against them. And the reason why we can say that, family, is because your enemy is also your neighbor, too. It's not like there's your neighbors and then there's your enemies. It's there's your neighbors. That's it. So, so you can't have, you, can, you might have someone who identifies you as an enemy, but don't be the kind of person that actually fulfills that reality. This is, this is an extraordinary kind of love that is only real or only realized in the kingdom of God. Any sinner can show ordinary love because ordinary love is conditional and transactional. If you love me or if you love, then I will love you. I treat you fairly if you treat me fairly. I will help you if you help me. I say kind things to you if you say kind things to me. I share with you if you share with me. I don't hurt you if you don't hurt me. I serve you if you have served me. I will change if you change. All of that is conditional, ordinary, and I'm not even sure I can call that love. Because unconditional love, and this is why those brothers said, it's better to be single. Because you don't have to perform... Unconditional love says this, guys, and this is the kingdom of God. This is how we are with all of us. This is how it should be with all of us. You don't have to perform or audition in order, for me to, uh, in order to receive my love. We don't require love in order for it to be reciprocated or to be given. Because we've seen and believed and received the extraordinary love from God. All of these things are pictures of Jesus being the model for us. And here's what we have to walk away with in these teachings here. You are the recipient of grace. That's why, though you probably deserve to be destroyed eternally, Christ took that on your behalf. Thank God that I'm seen as an image bearer. I'm made in his image. I'm not just some object, some, some random thing that was created like a tree. I'm made in his image. I have purpose. I have value. I'm, I'm, I'm made to represent the creator. And what Jesus does on the cross is he restores the, the beauty of being an image bearer. He, he restores and makes us right with God again through faith. He tells us the truth. There is no lying with God. He's not a man that he would change his mind. He says something, he means it. And so if we know that that is true, then the beautiful truths about what Jesus says for those who are seated with Christ is incredible good news. He, he actually secures our salvation. He tells us that he's going to be with us to the very end of the age. He actually resurrects from the grave just in case there's any question about that. 
and now we're seated with him in the heavenly places. He's coming back for his bride. We don't live as people who are wondering, did God really mean? Because, remember we said this, the enemy is the one that tells you to begin to put a question mark where God has already put a period. And so the beauty of the gospel and what Jesus does is he shows us how he is not doing away with this, but he's the fulfillment of all of these things. He's done these things perfectly and even shows us now where we fall short and why we need them. And so when we have challenges with one another, we remember that we have to maintain the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. And so there, there can't be a no reconciliation happening within the life of the church because we are one. And we're meant and called to display the oneness that Christ has accomplished on the cross. We're not creating anything new. This is not a new thing. This is a walking in what God has already established. And then a reminder that in the same way that the rain falls on the just and the unjust, the evil person and the righteous person. He's saying, look, even evil people have the chance to experience the love of God through just the natural order. And so in the kingdom of God, we're not picking and choosing who gets to experience the love of the Father. It's salt and light. So let your light shine among men so that when you see your good deeds, they will glorify your Father in heaven. When we read these things, we ought to look at it and say, oh, man, none of these things I have fulfilled. And so there's judgment at the cross that has to deal with the fact that we've fallen short of all of these things. But yet at the same time, there's justification there as well. Because through faith, God says, I dealt with this by crushing my own son. And now I don't necessarily need you to get all of this together, but I'm going to make you into a whole new person where ever so slowly, but in increasing measure, you're going to start to look more and more like the one who died for you. So th- 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 there is an expectation, guys, to grow in this. It's not just commanded things, and ah, but none of us will ever do this. And so, well, <laughs> let's just rest on the grace that's available to us. No, no, no. He saved. He died for you. He knew your inability to do this. So, so this is not the measure of what makes one right with God. So your justification, your righteousness is not what saves you. Jesus establishes that, and he accomplishes that for us. But now that he's given you his spirit, and now that you know that his word is always true, and so you're going to dwell with him for eternity, Your spirit doesn't just seal you for where you're going. It empowers you for where you are now. And so you need a regular, daily filling of his spirit because your heart needs to consistently be renewed. Remember how it talks about the mind. Be transformed. Don't be conformed into this world. It's so easy to do that. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you need heart renewal. This is all what the spirit is doing as he matures us and sanctifies us. This is the work of the spirit. So through faith, you've got to acknowledge your need. That's why a few weeks ago, blessed are the poor in spirit, because the poor in spirit recognize their spiritual bankruptcy. We don't, we're not sinners because we have sin. We sin because we are sinners. So when we consider these things, and we consider the beautiful reality of what, the hard teaching, I should say, of what Jesus presents, the the, the radical going the extra mile, uh, the, 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 the righteousness that surpasses that of the Pharisees, all of these are fulfilled in Christ, and he embodies perfect, he is the image of the invisible God. What this should do for us, if you know Jesus, if you are in relationship with him, you ought to, you have even more capacity to recognize and to lean into the, the God who saved you and to 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 ask for what's already available if you would just trust in him. Father, help me this morning. I have a grievance towards my brother, and I need need your help to resolve that. There's nothing in me that wants to, but I need your spirit to empower me. We have the ability through the power of the Holy Spirit to to, to walk in all these things he's called us to that are tough. For those of us who don't know Jesus, you depend on 
fulfilling all of these things perfectly. And you will fail. So as it stands, when you look at the holy and righteous God who is communicating the standard, just know if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, there is nothing that you're going to be able to do within your own right. I don't care how much you were able to, 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 to faithfully honor your wife all these years we've been married. If your heart has not been transformed, you have no relationship with him, and you will find yourself in a situation where just because you've declared God at some point in life, maybe when you received an award, I like to think when the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, um, without a relationship, there is no rest. Without a relationship, there is no hope. Without a relationship, there is no looking forward to what's after this because what's after this is judgment. So we just encourage you, I want to encourage you to just agree with God. <laughs> I don't, I can't do this perfectly. I, I get angry all the time. I can't, I can't, I, I have, I have lusted, I have lied, I have tried to self-preserve. And I need something outside of me because Whatever is inside of me has not been working has never, and never has. So the call is the same for us, those of us who believe, come to Jesus. The call and the expectation is for everyone in this room. We need Christ. And he says, come to me, all of who are weary and heavily burdened. If all of these things feel weighty, it is. But I will give you rest. Be faithful. So if you have not experienced that rest, or maybe you have, but you're backpedaling and you feel like you need rest, come to him, and he will lead us into the life everlasting. He will empower us with all that we need to glorify and honor him. Let's pray. Father, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? How can we possibly, in our own strength, be holy as you are holy. How do we fulfill and walk in obedience to the, the last word you said in our text today? Be perfect as I am perfect. Well, we know, Father, that we can. But we know that Jesus is perfect. And through him, we have received, through faith, we have received the righteousness that comes from God. Because it's the only righteousness that matters. And so, Father, our hands are open, our hearts are open, and we receive Christ this morning. It, 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 for, for those who don't know him, God, we just pray that you would open their eyes to see their need so that they would not trust in themselves, trust in their work, trust in their ability to be disciplined, to, to help them to see they have no power in and of, them, in and of themselves to, to, to be right with God. And so we, we all fall short. But we are so thankful that while we were yet sinners, you died, or you sent your son to die for us. While we were yet your enemy, you showed us your love. So God, help us to walk in the same way. That we would not see people primarily as an enemy, but as someone who does not yet recognize the joy and the life and the freedom that comes in relationship with you. So help us, God, to just honor you submit ourselves to you, to recognize our desperation and our inability to, to, to serve you without your strength. And we will give you all the glory as we pursue you every single day of our lives. We love you. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. And the church